Good morning, good afternoon to all of our audiences from around the world. I'm Yusuf Gamaluddin. I'm an anchorman for Bloomberg Television, and we've got a, a very timely and important discussion that is coming up in the pipeline. Basically, trade for tomorrow. Uh, what we've seen with the pandemic is that the differences and gaps between groups in society have grown. Uh, they are deep inequalities. Um, around that theme, the World Economic Forum just moments ago has released uh, two papers around this, one on trade and climate action and the other one uh, on trade and social justice. And I think what sort of caught my attention is the link between uh, climate change and trade specifically, definitely worth a, a closer look and uh, a closer read. We've got the 12th WTO ministerial conference that's coming up uh, early December, December 2021. And that's really a historic opportunity if you reflect for a moment on the sort of recent milestones in the WTO timeline. It's a historic opportunity to bring about, let's call it a bolder approach to policy reform. It's a call to action, effectively, what this panel is bringing together, a call to action for a new vision. And I'd like to introduce you to our distinguished panelists who are joining us today, and it includes Feti Maina, Cabinet Secretary for Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development in Kenya. We have uh, Matthew Layton, he's the uh, Global Managing Partner, Clifford Chance, UK and the International Business Council. Uh, Nabil Amudi, the Chief Executive Officer at Olean Financing Company, and Ankiti Bose, Co-Founder, Chief Executive Officer at Zlingo. Uh, Matthew, let me kick off with you in terms of where you see the need uh, for uh, more development in trade and investment to try and support a global recovery. Well, many thanks, Youssef, and it's it's great to be on the panel today. Um, perhaps having collaborated with the forum on the white paper on climate trade, um, I can start by focusing on greening trade and investment policy. Um, I don't feel it's an overstatement to say that we are standing at a pivotal moment as we look to rebuild the global economy post the, the pandemic. Um, but I believe we also stand at a point of immense opportunity. Uh, rightly, and as you've mentioned, the world has very high expectations for COP26 next month and also the 12th WTO ministerial conference later in the year. Um, and at the same time, many business, businesses sh are clearly sharing two priorities. Um, first, they're all looking to implement their climate uh, trans transition action plans, and that's to meet their ambitious, in many cases, net zero commitments. And they're recognizing the rising expectations of all of their stakeholders in, in doing this. Mm -hmm. Second, they're really rethinking and looking to redesign the resilient, sustainable, and in many cases, circular supply chains that are essential uh, for their businesses. So to that extent, there's really strong public and private alignment, and that should, it should drive an intense period of collaboration and cooperation to develop the stable policy framework, which is mm -hmm. so essential if we're going to have a sustainable and inclusive global trade and investment. From the work we did on the paper, perhaps I can just now turn to the, the how. Um, firstly, I think it's critically important that all areas of policy support decarbonisation and the objectives of inclusive and sustainable trade. Um, but, but trade policy is really important. It's the key mechanism for businesses to get access to the critical developing technologies. And I think there are three areas I just want to touch on quickly. Um, first, what's absolutely clear is, is the scale of investment that has to be made by businesses is huge. Um, and so the trade policy needs to enable technologies to move, be accessible across borders and for all businesses, particularly SMEs. And no doubt we'll come back to the point on SMEs later in the discussion. Yeah. Um, so businesses are clear. They want to see tariff and non-trade barriers for green technology to be reduced. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to reduce the cost of investment they need to make in decarbonisation. 
Yeah. Um, Matthew, if I, can, out- if I can just if I can just interject, yeah, you know, and I want, I'll, I'll I'll get back to you in a moment. I just want yeah. to widen out the conversation and, and get a few other points of view in here sure. uh, from the minister, Minister Betty uh, from Kenya. Where do you see uh, perhaps uh, an opportunity for more trade and investment uh, in terms of crafting sort of a health component and an inclusion component? Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me on the uh, forum. Uh, indeed, there's been uh, quite a long debate about the overall impact of trade, and particularly regional trade on populations, not just economically, but also in terms of health and well being. There are a large number of disputes about health in the WTO's te- um, uh, discussion. Uh, there is uh, technical barriers to trade uh, committee, which really brings more attention uh, to this matter. The WTO notes that protecting health is a dominant trade concern among members who seek to strike a balance between trade and health as they face potential economic costs and legal challenges when introducing new health measures. On the other hand, we have had great concern expressed by public health advocates about uh, regional trade agreements and uh, the health, uh, the risks that they pose um, to health. So we always have to balance all this. Uh, some of it may just be concerned about freedom of trade uh, in goods that may worsen uh, dietary uh, quality or the increased prices of pharmaceuticals or even extension of patent uh, production uh, protection. So mm-hmm. in my view, we need to be able to both promote uh, trade and at the same time, ensure that the trade uh, pays attention to matters of food security, to matters of reduction of malnutrition, as well as improving access to pharmaceuticals and uh, protection of investment. And this is always very, very challenging, balancing the interests of business and the interests of populations and yeah. public policy uh, concerns. In my view, trade and investment can do a lot more to support health and inclusion. And it is important that public policy uh, focuses on this core requirement to protect health and ensure uh, inclusion. And therefore, yeah. as we balance the interests of uh, our companies, we must do it in a manner that both promotes investment and promotes public health interests. Thank you very much. Yeah, Minister, we'll, we'll of course uh, flesh out some of the other angles to that in a moment. I wanna get out to uh, Nabil from the Olayan Financing Company just in terms of the, the last point the minister made around investment, I mean, what is your read on that, given that, uh, you know, only on financing companies, and, you know, 25 companies at a minimum operating across industries, you know, from food to energy services. And again, you cast also a global net in terms of uh, some of your other priorities. Uh, just run me through your initial thoughts here. Well, thank you, Yusuf, for having us, and thank you for uh, letting me join this great uh, panel. I think one of the points that I came across just from the two previous speakers is the complexity of the world that we live in. Uh, and that complexity is not simply now in the, in the government sphere, but it's become now a complex world for the private sector as well. Um, ESG concerns, stakeholder capitalism, you can kind of use whatever phraseology you want, but businesses are being asked to do a lot more than they have been in the past. So you're no longer looking purely at the, at the bottom line. And, and our group, of course, early on in uh, probably one of the first companies here in the kingdom, we started looking at our sustainability strategy at our operating company levels, which you mentioned are over 25 companies uh, here in the kingdom and the region, but also in our global investments uh, across the world. Um, and I think just from a trade perspective, having investments going across border enhances the ability of various countries to try to solve these global issues that we're, we're all facing, be it the COVID-19, be it the climate change issues. And I think fostering that kind of cooperation through businesses, we're seeing that happening more and more effectively. I mean, you can go back and look a couple of years ago, people weren't even talking about stakeholder capitalism. And then you have you know, Larry Fink coming out and uh, 
his uh, famous letter, kind of shifting the conversation with private sector, uh, really driving that. So I think that interaction and complexity is is important that the private sector uh, acknowledges and takes it and, and adheres to, and frankly, our employees require it of us uh, of us uh, now, uh, as well as our shareholders. And that now complexity in the private sector is mimicking what we're seeing or we've seen for forever. And I used to be in the government sector, the government sector as well. So complexity is the name of the game and, and solving these big issues need the private and the public sector to work together. And certainly investment across borders is key uh, for all of us to, to keep our eye on. I want to also get to uh, Ankiti, just in terms of how businesses can help support inclusion through their supply chains. I mean, it's a fascinating backstory uh, in terms of the, the reach that Zerlingo has through key points in the supply chain. Uh, what exactly is being done on that front? Uh, Yusuf, I think uh, the key thing for businesses as they come out of the pandemic and there is a huge uh, shift in the conversation towards ESG is to see if ESG can be tied closely to profitability. So it's not just about ESG comes at the cost of bottom line. Can those two things move together very nicely? And I think that becomes very interesting and it drives the adoption of ESG a lot faster. And for that, both policy and technology have to go together hand in hand. But, you know, in the textile and apparel supply chain, which contributes to almost 3% of global GDP, we've already started seeing that. And, and, you know, of course, we could dive into that a little bit later, but how profitability can be an additional sort of tool in the arsenal of uh, driving ESG adoption and not just, uh, you know, a, a moral lens. What about uh, maybe uh, taking the lead on that front, Ankiti? Couldn't you say, you know, here are the goalposts for our clients to make sure that we, as an umbrella organization, obviously overseeing this particular system, you know, is, is are in compliance with these new ideas. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so some of the biggest brands and large e-commerce companies that work with us uh, work backwards from those goals to say that, uh, folks, if you can improve our gross margins with technology by 10 to 15 percent, we are happy to plow that back into sustainable fabrics, making sure we only work with carbon neutral factories, uh, making sure that labor and environmental laws are followed at every step of the way, the middlemen are removed and value is added properly. It's just so much of a more effective way to do it when policy and technology can help businesses drive that because we understand that coming out of a pandemic, the economic stress is quite a bit. So tying those two things together can be really effective where possible, of course. Matthew, I want to circle back to you just in terms of the prep work that's being done to articulate a vision for the WTO deliberations later on this year. Uh, you talked a little bit about small and medium-sized enterprises. I mean, what would be the top action that you'd say needs to be taken to deliver better trade and build on some of the themes you've outlined? Well, I think, I think firstly, just picking up on the points that Antique and Nabil have made is, is, is looking to try and take out some of the complexity from the, from the regulation. So anything that can be done, complexity just adds cost and, and burden to businesses. So the more that can be done for seeing harmonization uh, of regulation, standards, et cetera, absolutely critical. Um, secondly, I think, you know, the, the, the big progress could be made around uh, widening um, e-commerce uh, trade. Um, E-commerce is so important for small businesses to access new markets and international markets. So that would be the second one that I'd really hi um, highlight, I think, Yusuf, as an important uh, point there. Uh, Minister, what would you say is the top action that, that could be used to uh, coordinate more effectively between trade partners and maybe make a meaningful change on a policy front for the WTO? Um, thank you very much. Uh, the WTO is a, is, is, is a strong and uh, powerful organization, and it is uh, an embodiment of our desire for you know, greater trade, more predictable trade, rule-based uh, trade, but also a fair trade that recognizes uh, the challenges of different, um, different countries. Now, when we, are, when we face pandemics such as uh, what we faced with COVID and, uh, and also changes in policies and politics in different uh, countries, there can be a departure from actually freer trade. We've seen that, for instance, with the conversations 
around uh, vaccines. And therefore, we need to re-energize the WTO to make it and to make uh, and, and, and to promote respect for its uh, principles. But at the same time, those principles need to recognize the challenges that especially, you know, poor countries con continue to face in accessing uh, global trade and ensure that uh, the, the rules are not uh, only in favor of multinationals, but recognize uh, the challenges that a lot of poor countries still face in integrating globally. I mean, it's a sensitive issue, isn't it, uh, Nabil? Just in terms of your experience from Saudi Arabia, again, a country that's uh, undergone massive changes to try and embrace global capital, I'm wondering uh, how you would characterize that evolution and whether it's now easier to trade, to do business with global partners than it has been maybe before 2015, 2016. Uh, yeah, great question. I mean, I think yes is the quick uh, answer. I think complexity of the legal systems and the structures and the governance of the kingdom has certainly improved markedly in the last four to five years. And we've seen this as a company that's been in business in the kingdom for the last 75 years. Um, and that has spurred a lot more investment in the kingdom from uh, foreign direct investment, especially through uh, the stock exchange. And I think uh, that's important that that kind of reforms Continue. In fact, we even saw some of the discussion that we just had on the WTO. The kingdom came out and the presidency of the G20, supportive of multilateralism, supportive of big initiatives on, on combating uh, climate change as well. And I think you're seeing a change. I think I, I, you are seeing a change in how the kingdom is, is operating locally, but operating on the uh, on, on the international stage as well. And that takes an adjustment from the private sector. I mean, we've again, like I said, we've been here 75 years. And how we work for the next 75 years is going to be radically different than the past 75 years. Globally, obviously, we want to see less barriers. We want to see uh, more stable, uh, uh, more stable uh, trade between countries, and more predictability in the rules-based um, environment that we live in, and less volatility, if I could use that word, and how and how things are managed. Volatility is not a friend of long-term investments uh, across borders. Uh, and Kitty, how do you see it from your perspective in terms of what the WTO can do? I mean, it's probably not a regular conversation that happens in terms of, you know, what, what kind of learnings uh, do you take from the kind of uh, businesses like yours and, and apply it to policy? And there's probably uh, a very important gap there to fill by institutions like the World Economic Forum and by a few other players as well. Uh, if you could sit in the room now with some of the, the top policy minds at the WTO, what would you say? What would you ask them to do? Uh, that's a great question, Yusuf. I think uh, uh, one thing that enables trade to happen very quickly with more digitization is interoperability of systems. And uh, that includes interoperability of payment systems, of quality standards, of the way that goods move between, uh, you know, one country and another. And in several supply chains, like the, the textile supply chain, it moves across several borders for the same product. So perhaps it would start with interoperability of trade and any policy that would help uh, technology companies to take uh, the digitization to as upstream as possible. What we see as a B2B enabler blur uh, of businesses is that businesses want traceability. They want to do the right thing. Uh, the question is how. And uh, when it comes to companies like us to solve for the how, we need more technology. And of course, we need more favorable uh, policy between countries. So I think just interoperability of payment structures and quality and uh, movement of goods uh, takes us further to do that, which leads to more traceability, which leads to more sustainability in the long run. Uh, just a reminder to our global audience uh, who are watching us that uh, we are going to uh, get to some of the questions. been really busy in the chat, so please keep them coming in. We still have about five to six, six minutes of uh, sort of time for me, uh, and then uh, we'll open it up to the floor. So I'm going to return back to Matthew just in terms of uh, the recent tensions between China and the United States that still continue to be at the forefront of uh, much of, you know, much of global capital, really and global markets, uh, there was a hope, there was an understanding, uh, a belief maybe, that things are going to get better uh, in terms of those tensions with the new administration in the United States under Joe Biden. 
but clearly that ha hasn't happened. I'm wondering what you're hearing from clients and how that could affect what the WTO does or does not agree on come December. Yeah, look, I, I, I think there was that hope. Uh, however, I think we have to be realistic. There's a lot of focus on domestic politics, domestic policy in the post-pandemic um, environment. So there hasn't uh, been the, the shift, the positive shift that people had had been hoping for. Uh, but I think in the longer term, I think people still remain uh, very positive that you know, the, 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 the need and also, you know, as we've talked about, the very wide engagement from stakeholders, employees, and, and, and also you know, the, 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 uh, the public at large to see action on issues like health, on climate change, et cetera, will, will bring, bring people to the table. Um, and that's got to be good for, 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 for businesses um, uh, in those countries as well. So ultimately, I think there's still, you know, from certainly our clients, a high expectation that whilst we may be in a period where you know, tensions remain quite uh, uh, quite, uh, quite high, that ultimately mm -hmm. we'll see them coming together for real progress on some of the key issues that we've been talking about today. Uh, Minister Betty, in terms of how you look at this, because at the end of the day, you've got this trade governance system that is you know, struggling to adapt. I mean, let's, let's not sugarcoat it. It is what it is. This is an antiquated institution uh, the world's changed so rapidly. The two behemoths of political powers are at odds. Uh, is it still fit for purpose, the WTO? Well, um, thank you very much. It is a tough question, but uh, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, do we, do we have a choice? We need to make um, global trade uh, work better because it can, uh, it can be a powerful tool for development and for uh, poverty uh, reduction. But it won't happen uh, automatically and, uh, and not all poor people can connect as quickly as we would want. Technology is helping a lot, e-commerce is helping a lot, but we need to work on both uh, systems. So we do need to make the WTO uh, more amenable for the realities we find ourselves in. And for those of us, you know, in the countries like Africa, we are also investing a lot in regional trade. So we recognize that we would like to trade as much as possible with every corner of the world and technology is making that happen. But we also need to trade better uh, with our neighbors and therefore uh, using uh, regional trading blocks uh, like the East African community, the Africa continental free trade area, or COMESA are springboards for attracting investment in our regions, but also uh, engagement globally is the, is, is, is the tools that we need to work on. So we need to address the challenges that the WTO has, has had, ensure that uh, we build on our own local uh, dynamics and ensure that investors are able, and I, first of all, are able to invest in all countries, but more importantly, that the rules of the game are not, uh, are, are not steeped against mm -hmm. populations, especially in poor countries. I mean, it's a very, very potent point that you make around regional trade blocks, and that, that is perhaps the chance to sort of reinvigorate the, some, of, some of these parts of the global trading system. Uh, you know, Nabil, uh, could you weigh in on this for us, maybe from a, a perspective in the Middle East, because there were as well these ambitions to create closer trade ties, less tariff barriers. Uh, is this an opportunity for the Middle East to, to step in and perhaps to show how it's done, even though their track record has not been the strongest? But, you know, clearly that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't do it if they don't put their minds to it. Yeah, great question. I mean, uh, I think the the quick answer is, is yes. There's more opportunities there that are that are being uh, that are not being taken advantage of, and and the, the GCC region certainly is a region that could be trading with global partners on a much more accelerated basis than is currently the case. And we see uh, a disparity, frankly, between the countries on how that happens. Uh, but as a block, I think there is more coordination now than there has been in the past. Uh, but it's certainly something that needs to to continue. Uh, your neighborhood matters, obviously, and where you where you're physically and geographically situated that provides opportunity, natural opportunities for to for trade to flourish. Um, and I think that's certainly not an option that 
I think the, the governments are looking at. And when somebody else mentioned, I, I believe, is also obviously electronic commerce, ensuring that, you know, bytes are translated into bricks effectively and delivering goods is something that still has not really been very, um, very conducive in, in, in the region. It's getting better, but sort of the, the blocks part of it hasn't really reached to the point where you can ensure with a click that you get your, uh, your Nike shoes in, in two days. That still hasn't happened uh, in the region. I think more of that will happen, uh, but uh, that's more about the bricks as opposed to the bytes and, and the regulation standpoints as well in terms of import and customs and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I'll say, I'll say this much. They've introduced overnight shipping here in, in Dubai for some of the bigger stores, and it's incredible. I thought it would never come to this part of the world. And, and now you just yeah, you even have same-day same day delivery, which is a whole different world. I know in the U.S. and the U.K. it's been around for ages, but uh, anyway, that, that sort of tells the tale of, of, of shifting times. Uh, and Kiti, just in terms of the point of view that you bring to this discussion, and just being based, of course, predominantly in Asia, you're dealing with a lot of uh, suppliers from across borders. Um, do you see friction there? Where is, where is the opportunity? Where is, where, where is something that, uh, that can be improved on? Um, actually, uh, uh, something that uh, you mentioned a little bit before, especially on friction with China, has been an interesting tailwind for some of the countries that we work in. We are primarily in ASEAN. We are headquartered in Singapore. And I'm merely making an observation, but uh, we've seen a massive growth in um, uh, sourcing, especially digitized, fully transparent sourcing with all the data from countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Indonesia, India, Sri Lanka pick up over the last five years. And in the last Last two years, it's actually only accelerated. So after the COVID slum, there have been some major, um, uh, major tailwinds for the industry. And of course, uh, right now we're in the middle of uh, a little bit of an up and down in Vietnam from a from a trading and supply chain standpoint. And it has been a bizarre year with so many container costs going up and shipping problems and uh, you know the Suez Canal and raw material prices and so on. But so far, it seems like ASEAN and South Asia are very resilient options for, for several um, several supply chains uh, and especially many that support uh, e-commerce uh, consumption across the region and ties with Middle East, Europe, uh, UK and the US have only strengthened as far as exports from this region are concerned. So it's a very interesting time yeah. to be based in Singapore right now. I have to say like 30 minutes uh, to cover all this ground. I mean, it, it, it's it's as good as our morning show on Bloomberg TV, which I host every morning from 8 to 9. I do urge you to watch if you don't already have it uh, in your regular schedule. But this has been uh, packed with insight, and we're still going to open it up now, though, to questions. We've gotten a lot of them. Uh, the first one to Matthew, uh, specifically, how can trade rules help climate action? Zero tariffs on green bonds, question mark. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think looking at tariffs that, that uh, can can incentivize investment, whether that's you know tariffs on you know um, carbon carbon friendly goods, whether it's on green bonds, clearly financing is 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 a key key issue there. Um, the other area that I just touch on, it, you know, what I mentioned is is some of the uh, you know standardization, both in terms of uh, you know reporting, but also on goods uh, again promoting um, and lowering the cost of, of green green goods green tech green technologies so I think there's a lot that can be done um, with, with relatively small steps um, the other point I'm just coming back to the conversation we're just having about you know the role of the WTO but but I think Nabil captured this um, really important that you know we don't just look to the WTO there's lots that can be done on a unilateral and and a plurilateral basis of regional deals so a lot of progress can be done there but it takes takes leadership and and again lots of uh, cooperation between the public and the private sector as well. Fantastic. All right. The second question here, this is open to the panel. So if you feel strongly about it, uh, just uh, go ahead and, and answer. Uh, if governments can't agree on linking trade, investment and sustainability, can business push harder? I'll uh, take a shot at that. I, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I think you're, you're seeing that anyway, right? Yeah. I think that's almost in the rear view mirror in some ways where you're seeing a lot more pressure from, from big entities on, on, uh, from various again, stakeholders, not, just not to repeat myself, uh, that are pushing to try to, to further the, the green agenda, the ESG issues, and to uh, 
address all these uh, global issues? So I think the answer is obviously yes. Anybody else like to, to add to that, uh, Yusuf? I think, uh, yeah. I, I think definitely businesses can. A lot of businesses are now run by people that have understood, like myself, that we will all be alive to live through the consequences of lack of ac action on climate change or inaction on inclusion. So, um, you know, whether or not uh, there is enough help possible, of course, we will continue to ask for more help from both policy and other, uh, you know, other parts, other stakeholders. But there is no option for our generation but to act on it. So the answer is a strong yes. Yeah, maybe just Thank one other I point from, from me, Yusef, which is just, um, you know, again, there's really good action being taken amongst businesses in terms of reporting and transparency. So the work that the IBC and the forum have done around the stakeholder uh, capitalism metrics to, to, to get some standardization in the approach of all of these things, that's critically important because transparency in, it is, is key here. Minister? Yes, I, I, I agreed. And uh, I've say, we've seen a lot of changes driven by consumer demand, which changes how business is uh, running. So in fact, uh, sometimes you find that governments are, you know, are racing up to catch up with uh, some of the actions of business. It's also driving uh, policy uh, quite a bit. I think the, the, the point to make is that this is a movement we've seen with multinationals a lot, but that also uh, sends examples to SMEs. And I think the more consumers make these demands, I think there'll be, we, we can expect some changes from policymakers as well. Excellent. Uh, another question coming through. Uh, is it possible to distinguish good subsidies, so health environment, at least according to this particular comment, from, quote, bad protectionist ones. Is that to me or anybody, that's any all, of us? That's, that's, that's to anybody, but if you'd like to take a shot. Yeah, I, one of the things, uh, and I mentioned that in my, in, 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 in my comments, is um, a lot of the rules, say, around trade have clearly been shaped by, 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 by businesses. And uh, some of those rules can confer benefits to particular businesses, uh, can also uh, act and appear very, very uh, protectionist. And I think it is the role of policymakers to unpack them. And for each rule, for each move, for each decision, there has to be a, a public policy impact assessment and, uh, and, and, and a look at the, 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 the varieties and the differences uh, in, in, you know, in countries. Uh, in the WTO, there's been a strong uh, stakeholder, um, maybe strong movement uh, from um, developing countries to interrogate each move from the perspective of uh, poverty and development. And I think that must, that, 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 that must, uh, must continue and large businesses and small businesses uh, together have an opportunity to compromise uh, on uh, different uh, measures and different subsidies they might be seeking or different protection they might be seeking from, uh, for, for, from, for, from their government. Uh, any other views on, on this particular question? Uh, if not, I've got, uh, you know, obviously there's, there's a lot more to get through, but unfortunately we're not gonna have the time. Uh, we're starting to run a little bit uh, towards the limit. If governments, let me paraphrase that, can trade rules support inclusion and sustainability by encouraging a fairer tax system? Tough question, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I think Matthew might be uh, more suited, but that's, that is a tough question. And uh, I'm not sure really if I have a strong view on that. Probably the answer is I think so, but I'm not sure I have more insights than that. And more thinking uh, needs to be done from my end, at least. I mean, look, I mean, the observation I would make here is that, um, you know, what we're really looking at is 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 promoting growth and opportunity um, through both sustainable investment and inclusive investment. So I, I, I would hope the answer is that, you know, we can find the way. It's not some of these issues are highly complex, but I think we can find a way to come up with the 
policies and the structures that do promote promote that. But it needs again, it needs real real engagement. Um, maybe maybe one other point just to make is it just which I think these these two the last two questions are probably linked in some way is is we can't look at this just through the prism of the advanced. Uh, uh, countries um, and you know, for example, the 100 billion commitment in the Paris Agreement is something that really is essential if we're going to see development um, and progress right across the across the globe. So, recognizing that commitment, recognizing that you know, for example, I think this was a point that President von der Leyen made in her State of the Union speech last week was, you know, it's really important that the advanced nations um, step up and honour that that uh, that commitment if we're going to see this have, have truly global impact. Yeah, and, and the tricky part is that what's trying to be done is to align uh, some of the trade action with the COP26 outcomes, which is... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's quite the quest. Uh, in terms of Q&A, that's all the time we have, unfortunately. But what I'd love to do now is for each of our panelists to take a minute, 60 seconds. There's going to be a buzzer and a big red light. So after 60 seconds, that's all we've got. So just to reflect and review some of your takeaways uh, from this session. So I, want to, I want to start off with that. Ankiti, go ahead. Um, I think uh, my number one reflection is that everybody uh, from policymakers, uh, trade organizations, governments, think tanks and businesses, everybody understands that change has to be made and everybody understands that uh, it's now or it's too late and everybody understands that digitization is an important lever in that, which is already great because the conversation has shifted from five years ago uh, into a much more actionable doing mode. Uh, so as businesses, uh, I think the key takeaway way for me or my entire, I think, community of startup technology enthusiasts and founders is that uh, raise your hand, do something, ask for help. You'll probably get it now way more easily than before. And there is just active investment happening here. So it's actually very encouraging. Yeah, very inspirational. Uh, Nabil? Uh, I guess the one takeaway for me is something I already stated, but it's that stability for uh, uh, the rules and, and the uh, what Matthew focused on as well is that the coordination of between the various uh, standards is important for, for private sector to be able to allocate capital on a long-term basis in the right way. And without that kind of stability and uniformity, you, you get capital that is just not as, as, as confident in investing in the right sectors and over the long term. Uh, and that's not an easy equation to balance, but uh, since the world is changing so quickly, but that's something that, uh, that we need to somehow strike the right balance for. Thank you very much, Minister Betty. Thank you, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, my, my key takeaway for this is that we need to keep working together and we need to keep building the institutions that bring us together because we're in this, now. No, no, we're not an island, no, 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 no country is an island, no community is an island and therefore uh, conferring or making decisions that confer benefits to one set of countries is not sustainable in the you know in the, in the long run, and you have to invest in other mechanisms to secure you know, to secure yourself. So the best thing is to ensure that the rules work must work for all if we are going to be safe. Thank you. And Matthew. Yeah, finally, just building on some of those themes. But I think, um, you know, firstly, the, there is huge alignment at this point in time. So we should seize this opportunity. Um, secondly, uh, you know, I think we need to take some quick wins. Some of these issues are really complex, but actually moving forward with some of the quick wins that have been identified in removing tariff barriers, et cetera, simplifying, harmonizing standards, et cetera, which should not be controversial. But those would give a really powerful signal that, you know, uh, governments and businesses and policymakers can really work together to make some concrete steps on this journey. And it is a journey. So banking some of those quick wins would be really important, I think. That's a great note to wrap up on. Uh, there is still plenty more, though, to discuss beyond this panel. I'm just looking here at all the links and all the additional tangents that our global audience can, of course, explore. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you uh, the wonderful panelists for all the insight and reflection uh, we had on the panel, of course, 
Minister Betty Maina, Cabinet Secretary for Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development uh, of Kenya. Uh, Matthew Layton, Global Managing Partner, Clifford Chance UK, and also member of the International Business Council. Nabil Lamoud, the Chief Executive Officer at the Olayan Financing Company, and Ankita Bose, co-founder and chief executive at Zilingo. Remember, you can uh, continue the discussions on Toplink, and we do ask you to share maybe some of your strong views that you've shared today on social media. Get on there, on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, whatever you use and whatever floats your boat. Uh, go ahead and share that and make sure you have the right handles in there as well. And for me, you know, on a personal note, thank you again not just to the panel, but to everybody who took the time out of the day to watch this very important conversation. And I wish you all the best for the day ahead. Thank you.